This conference will about, now be uh, recorded. Okay, uh, so uh, it's good to be back here talking about things, places that unfortunately none of us can visit for the next one month or two months at least. But hopefully after that, we'll all get a chance to go back to these beautiful spots. Um, so I'm going to turn off my video just to make sure the bandwidth is not being used up too much. And probably at the end, when there's a question answer session happening, I will come back on on video once again. What have I done? I'm just trying to figure this out. One second. One sec. I've done something which is making the videos panel look big. I need to collapse it back. Uh, Uma, can you help me out with this? Yeah. So can everyone see my screen now? Yep. Sorry about that small hiccup. So I'm going to turn, like I said, I'm going to turn off my video and uh, just uh, keep my voice going and the slides changing just to save some bandwidth. Um, I live in a place with not such a great internet. So there could be some uh, lag in the way the slides change because sometimes I press the button here and the, for the slides to change at your end, it might take a three or four second or maybe even a five second delay. And we just have to bear with all that. So I'm gonna turn off my video and here we go. So this topic or this huge uh, journey that we're talking about today is not something that can be covered in half an hour or one hour. It's a it's a huge, huge country. It's a subcontinent, as people call it. And there is a lot happening here with regards to wildlife and biodiversity. So I definitely won't be doing justice today to all of it. But what I've tried to put together is something which can maybe instill an interest and maybe uh, arouse your curiosity to know more about this wonderful country of ours. Um, and when I say wonderful, I'm being very particular that I'm talking only about the non-urban places. And I, I, I don't think there's anything nice to say about our cities for now. Um, so here we go. Wild India, a journey that could last a lifetime, and that is definitely my lifetime. I've been roaming around the country for the last, uh, for the last one, one year and uh, sorry for the last one decade and it has been i've just realized that despite my interest being narrow i'm more interested in the smaller stuff i am going to need more than just one lifetime to see what our country has to offer forget the rest of the world so i'm going to try to bring about a few interesting places i have visited and also try to give an overall picture of the various wildlife in the various parts of the country and also uh, talk about experiences or what an experience actually is or what a safari actually is. Um, maybe it's going to be a mix of different things. So just bear with me on this. So this is how um, I'm just going to wait for the slide to change. Yeah, so this is how all of you know India as. In fact, the whole world knows India as this. And uh, this is like a big country, a lot of cities, full of uh, people, a lot of development happening all over, a lot of uh, disparity in, in society. There is very crowded places, there is crowded cities, crowded markets, there's highways, railway tracks, everything all over the place. So where exactly does this wildlife we are talking about exist? Where is the space for the wildlife we are talking about? We are talking about 1.3 billion people 
and an ever-growing population. So when you talk about biodiversity and a lifetime worth of the journey, which areas are we actually talking about? So to put that in perspective, I'd like to show a different map of India. This is a map uh, done by a close friend of mine. Uh, his name is Rohan. He runs a, 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 a wildlife... Uh, uh, it's not a cartooning, it's more like a wildlife illustration studio. It's called Green Humor, where he talks about a lot about conservation. And he made this beautiful map. And this, I think, puts into perspective exactly what, how or how I or a lot of naturalists like me look at India. So it has no cities, it has none of the roads, railway tra tracks, national highways, industries, coal mines, anything. It just has the wildlife or the key wildlife found in different parts of the country. And I will be making a lot of references to this map during this journey. So you can see our country has a multitude of colors when it comes to terrain. It has the, the yellows, the, the browns, the dull greens, the dark greens, the whites, the blues. We have all kinds of terrain in our country. And there is no wonder that it's called a subcontinent. So as we can see here, this is a view of Himalayan mountain range from Great Himalayan National Park in Himachal Pradesh. And this is also part of our country. And then you move to the other end of the spectrum, away from the forest, away from the high peaks, and then you hit the deserts of Rajasthan. And when I say desert, we know only deserts of Rajasthan, but to be honest, even Tamil Nadu is a desert. Even parts of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh is a, are a desert. Parts of Maharashtra are a desert. Gujarat is a desert. So we have deserts spread throughout our country. And strangely enough, we have the high mountains, we have the deserts. And in between the deserts and the high mountains, we have the Shola forests of the Western Ghats and also the rainforest of Northeast India. So this is exactly between the Himalayas and us, and the barrier is a beautiful rainforest or a mountain grassland, which is one of the wildlife hotspots of the world. And this is also there in our country. And there is a very interesting ecosystem, which is often ignored. Uh, I don't know how many of you are from uh, Tamil Nadu here. Uh, uh, we call this often as Porambokal. Uh, uh, in Tamil, but it basically means a land which is wasted. It's a wasteland. So, but that is our grasslands, the most easy to develop, easy to ignore, because we associate forests with trees. And when you have a flat area which is full of grass, the first thing we think about is airports. It's a great place for an airport, a la large area for a runway. And that is honestly what has happened to most of our grasslands. Like Delhi Airport is built on a grassland, Ahmedabad is built on a grassland. Chennai is built on a marshy grassland. So all our airports are built on this unique habitat, which supports beautiful animals like the black buck that we see here. But unfortunately, we and even the forest department, unfortunately, don't look at them as forest or critical habitats where biodiversity needs to be conserved. That's the unsad state of our grassland. So these are all vast areas. But then we have interesting niche habitats in our country. Uh, one of which is what you see here. What you see, those white lines, is not the ocean, it's not a mirage, but it's actually the salt flats of Kutch. It's actually the salt pan, which is found in the Gulf of Kutch, in, which is a part extension of Gujarat. And that is an incredible landscape, which again feels lifeless, but with the salts and the islands and the saltwater rivers and the freshwater rivers that go through it, the land is alive and it is beyond imagination if you actually jump in and understand what is exactly happening in that uh, probably a 15 or 20 centimeter thick layer of salt. And that's exactly what it is. So we've spoken about mountains, deserts, grasslands, rainforests, niche habitats. And then we also have one of the longest coastlines in the world. And our coastline, apart from our beaches and rocky uh, coastline we also have the mangroves and of course the most famous and the most iconic of them is the sundarbans but mangroves even just outside chennai or near koringa marshes in the krishna delta or the godavari delta are all as rich and as important as uh, some of the natural catastrophes in the recent past have shown that if you have good mangroves good vegetation the 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 wind force and the water force that comes in from the uh, from the coast 
into inland areas is actually stopped. But there is a lot more happening here than just being a natural barrier for us and a safety protection. And of course, the most widespread and the most common idea of a forest is what I'm going to come to last, and which is what we have throughout the country. Uh, that is our traditional forest with a lot of trees, a lot of uh, grasslands, a lot of deer, a lot of uh, our, our famous big cats. All of them are here. And this is what covers most of our country. And, and when I have said all this, I have just uh, touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of our habitats. But it just gives you a broad perspective of what we have in our country. But fortunately or unfortunately, when we talk about our wildlife in our country, not just Indians, but all over the world, we talk about this amazing animal, which is the Bengal tiger. Our, of course, our national animal, a symbol for all our forests. And it is also something beyond life. You know, people who have seen a tiger, we can just imagine how amazing it is. In fact, the last talk I did for Uma and her, uh, and, and this session was basically on tigers. Uh, it, is, it is an extensive session on tigers. But today it's not about that. But what I'd like to just touch upon this topic, what India has done to become the tiger capital of the world is commendable because tigers are actually found in 13 different countries in the world. But unfortunately, India is the only place which can actually talk about tigers or show tigers or even have a good number of tigers in its forests despite our, our problems in India. Because if you look at the map, the other subspecies of tigers, right from Russia to uh, Sumatra to Bali to Borneo, all those tigers have, have disappeared already or are disappearing right now. And some of them, as you can see in gray, have already uh, become extinct. So we have the right to call the tiger our national pride. It is because of the work we have put in. But there is obviously a lot more ha happening in our country than just tigers and that's what this talk is going to be about in fact uh, we have another big cat in our country which people don't often associate with in india and that is of course the asiatic lion because uh, the A lions are generally associated with africa but the asiatic lion is found in gir in india and in historically there are records or there is proof that tigers and lions coexisted in in the same forest especially in areas like parts of Maharashtra, parts of Western Madhya Pradesh, there have been records of tigers and lions being reported in the same forest patch, which is quite incredible to think that such large big cats have roamed our country in the past, and I still continue to do so, despite our constant expansion and our constant greed to go into their forests and remove their habitat. But it's still there and it still exists today, though not together, but they both still exist in our country today. But tigers, like I mentioned in the previous talk, are found throughout the country, from the high Himalaya to the mangroves to the rainforests to even parts of the desert. But I want to just get to a particular habitat of the tiger, which most of us are familiar with, of course, which is like our Mudumalai or Kanha or Bandavgarh or Satpura, basically the central Indian area or the south Indian uh, forest. And that will give us an idea of what kind of wildlife lives along with the tiger. So, of course, everyone is familiar with the most numerous animal or numerous prominent animal of the forest, which is, of course, the spotted deer. The more the number of spotted deer, we are going to have a good number of tigers. So, generally, with the increase in prey or increase in the prey density, you're going to have a good number of tigers. So spotted deer, of course, form the backbone. And of course, the first thing we see when you go to any forest is the spotted deer. But we also have the gore. I'd like to mention here that this is not a bison. A lot of people call it a bison, but it's not a bison. It is a gore, G-A-U-R, or the Indian gore. And it's actually the largest bovine in the world, or the largest species of cow or cattle in the world. The adults can get up to 1.2 to 1.4 tons. And there are records of tigers bringing down gore. And that shows how incredible these big cats are, these tigers, that they can bring down a gore. So a gore is also an indicator species of the prey density for a tiger population. So we have uh, prey, we have uh, big cats, but we also have interesting animals like the sloth bear, 
which uh, again go in, uh, which again are found alongside the tiger. So sloth bear again, we have four species of bear in our country, but sloth bear is the one which which roams most of our country. In fact, the, most of our forests have sloth bears. And a lesser known animal uh, which people don't generally talk about much, but this is the Asiatic wild dog or more popularly or locally known as dole, D-H-O-L-E, dole. So dole is probably the top predator in the jungle. Like a good sized pack of wild dogs, like maybe a pack of 15 to 16 dogs, nothing comes close to them. They are very successful hunters because they don't hunt by stalking prey like tigers do. They hunt by chasing prey over large distances. So their success rate is higher because they depend on their stamina than surprise. But also there are records in the past of wild dogs taking on tigers and tigers avoiding them. So you can imagine how formidable a force a pack of wild dogs can be. So we have spoken about the largest cat and the members of the forest that live alongside it. But even this cat, which is the smallest wild cat in the world, it's called the rusty spotted cat, lives along with the largest wild cat in the world, the, the Bengal tiger, in the same forest. How interesting is that? So this uh, Asiatic uh, uh, rusty spotted cat is actually one of the 15 species of cats, including tiger, which are found in India. The whole of Africa has 10 species of cats. But the smallest one is the rusty spotted cat in the world. And the largest one, the Bengal tiger, both are found in the same forest patches in our country. And of course, the most uh, ignored animal of our forest, despite being beautiful, despite being a big cat, despite being heavily sought after by photographers, is the leopard. The leopard has always lived in the shadow of tiger conservation. So in our focus to conserve our tigers, we have ignored our leopards. And leopards actually are facing a huge decimation of their numbers, even in the recent years because of conflict, expanding forests. So tigers are well protected in their the tiger reserves. Of course, there are issues there, but leopards, just because of their adaptability, are found in a huge area in our country. But are constantly increasing and we are not even bothering to check what their numbers are. So that is the situation of leopards. In our country. And But talking about leopards, I'd like to mention one interesting place, which according to me is the best place to see wild leopards in the world. And it's quite surprising that that is in India. Can you believe that? So this area uh, in the southern Aravalis, in the, near the famous city of Udaipur, there's a small place called Bera. And Bera is an interesting story uh, because it is just large granite boulders situated amongst fields and villages. And these granite boulders have holes inside them where leopards live. And they come out in the evenings to hunt maybe peacock, the stray dog, or uh, sometimes they take livestock, but they have never attacked another person. And this is the story of the last 125, 130 years. So leopards have actually coexisted with humans here. And the recent big push for these leopards is the tourism because the tourism money is compensating the villagers for their livestock and employing people. So the tolerance of the leopards is very high. So can you imagine leopards living on just rocks, no trees, no bushes to hide from, and you can actually see them as clearly as you see a cow in the streets of Chennai. And that's how amazing it is. And I've been to parts of Africa, parts of Sri Lanka to see leopards, but, and I've been to, of course, your Kabini and Satpura and all the leopard, great leopard places of India, but I don't think anything comes close to the experience of seeing a leopard in Bera. It is truly unique in the whole world for this cat. And again, I'd like to uh, talk about one other very common misconception. This black animal in front is also a leopard. It's just a black leopard, though the Americans have made it popular by calling it a black panther. The black leopard is just a melanistic leopard. It has an extra coat of melanin or black pigmentation in its body. And this is actually a picture of a mating pair from the Negris, taken by Prakash Ramakrishnan. And the male, you can see, is huge, he's solid, but the female is smaller. And this is a mating pair. And leopards, uh, the photograph of this, uh, these leopards on the rocks have actually changed what a lot of people assume that black leopards were a different animal and uh, normal leopards are different. So this is an interesting uh, comparison. But talking about leopards on rocks, it takes me to only one place in India. 
Leopards on Rocks takes me to this uh, corner of India, which is Ladakh, which is the northernmost tip. In fact, it is even beyond the Himalayas. It is the cold desert of our country, Ladakh. And a lot of you know Ladakh. Of course, it's a popular place recently because it's, it has opened up for tourism. It has these uh, pastel-hued hills. It has these large monasteries, villages. Not much, no more of a rocky country. So amongst these rocks lives the animal I've been privileged to be working with for the last four years. And that is, of course, the snow leopard. So the snow leopard is found in India in parts of the Himalayas above a certain altitude. So even in Ladakh, they live at altitudes from 3,500 meters to up to 5,000 meters or maybe a little higher. And they live only in this rocky country. In fact, their actual name should have been a rock leopard because in snow, they don't do as well as they do in open rocky country. And that's what they do. And it's a fantastic animal to see because it has this long tail which is uses for balance. It has short feet to make sure its center of gravity is less. And of course, it has the thick fur. Uh, to make sure it is warm and insulated in freezing conditions of Ladakh. So to see snow leopards, we go usually in the winter months and the locals have become fantastic at spotting these animals. And there are a few places you have a, where you can have a good chance of seeing them. So snow leopards are there, but along with snow leopards, there's a whole lot of other wildlife that occupies this landscape which looks lifeless to the naked eye. And one of them, again, like our leopards, which is often ignored, is the Tibetan wolf. So this animal lives again in the shadow of the snow leopard, like how leopards live under the shadow of tigers. So the wolves also are amongst the top predators of our Himalayan region. But unfortunately, because of conflict, they're often poisoned and killed. And we actually don't know much about the number of wolves because people have been so focused on studying about snow leopards they, they've forgotten that there is another important animal that we need to look at. Uh, that is kind of what happens when you have an amazing species which people want to save, like the tiger or the one-horned rhino, but then you lose focus on the other things that are happening on the side. Uh, it has its benefits, it has its pros and cons, but for the, for the Tibetan wolf, saving the snow leopard and focusing on the snow leopard has been the biggest problem. So, of course, when you have carnivores, we are going to have herbivores. And, of course, we don't have deer in Ladakh. We have wild goat and sheep. And this, of course, is the Himalayan ibex, which is a wild goat. Of course, the best way to tell a goat is that it has a beard and the sheep doesn't have a beard. It's as simple as that for those who don't know. Uh, this is a Himalayan ibex, which is a beautiful uh, animal that lives in the rocky cliffs. Amazing balance. Again, short feet for low center of gravity like the snow leopard. And they can actually run down a cliff face as fast as they can run on, uh, on flat ground. And, and it's an amazing animal to see, the Himalayan ibex. And earlier I mentioned we have four species of bear in our country. Of course, we were talking about the sloth bear then. But do you know that the largest land carnivore in our country is not the tiger, but the Himalayan brown bear? So the Himalayan brown bear is again found in parts of Ladakh and the Himalayas, where uh, these animals hibernate in the winter months from December to April. And when they come out in April, they come out usually with their young ones because they give birth when they're in hibernation. And they come out and raid the villages and also feed heavily on plants and fruit. So it is, again, a huge conflict situation. Again, an animal which is heavily ignored. In fact, the bears were worst affected by the Kargil war because most of their habitat is around Kargil, Dras, Sonmar, Bushko, and all those areas. And that is where a battle, a huge battle was fought. And if you actually look at that battle from the point of view of this animal, I think the worst hit amongst all of it was this bear. And people still don't talk about these animals. They're still persecuted and killed. But it is probably one of the most amazing animals I have seen in the snow-covered mountains of the Himalayas, simply because of its size and also how well adapted it is to the freezing conditions of Ladakh. So we have spoken about the cold deserts, um, and we, which is on the northern side of the Himalayas. Now I want, you to I want to bring you guys to the other side of the Himalayas, which is the Terai, which is also the hot and humid belt south of the Himalayas, which is where the rivers which are flowing down these gorges from the mountains kind of widen in the plains and form these flood plains. And that is the most fertile part of our country. 
Unfortunately, we have converted a large portion of it for tea and farming because it was ideal conditions, but there is still some remnant wildlife there. And probably the most Im important of the remnant wildlife that is found there is our uh, Asian one-horned rhinoceros, or the Indian one-horned rhinoceros, or uh, the rhino. This animal has an amazing story uh, behind its conservation. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know, they, were, they are heavily poached for their horn, which is basically keratin, which is the same as our nail. But unfortunately, some people in some part of the world think that it does more than just, uh, it does the, more than just what keratin should do. So today, uh, we are seeing rhinos in good numbers in a large part of our country. Of course, Kaziranga, Manas, parts of northern West Bengal, parts of Uttar Pradesh, which is Dudwa. We are seeing rhinos and also Nepal. But in the 60s and 70s, there were, I think, around 68 rhinos left of the whole world, Asian one-horned rhinos in Kaziranga. And from then on, the government and some good officers took an initiative to save them. And from then till now, we have more than 3,000 to 4,000 rhinos. And in fact, we have excess rhinos in parks like Kaziranga, which we are giving out to the other uh, parks and even uh, even to Nepal. So there is a lot happening. And this is actually one of the lesser told conservation success stories in India. Of course, when you have giants like the rhino, we also have to speak about the giants uh, like the Indian elephant. Uh, I don't think I have, I have a more beautiful, more charismatic, more an animal I'd like to watch for longer than the elephant. Um, we know, of course, uh, elephants are there in South India, but the largest contiguous belt for elephants is in the Himalayan foothills. In fact, elephants used to go all the way from Assam, all the way to Bhutan, to Nepal, and even uh, further west towards Kobet. But of course, a lot of those connects are broken now, but elephants are still surviving in good pockets throughout this habitat, along with the rhino and, of course, the tiger. So this is actually the belt of giants. The, 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 of course, the water buffalo, the elephant, the rhino, the tiger, the crocodiles, all of them uh, kind of are uh, occupy this habitat. So you can actually call it the land of giants in India. Talking about giants, if you visit the forests around these floodplains, you have a very interesting animal, especially in the uh, eastern extremes, Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. This is, of course, the great ape, uh, the hulok gibbon. We, again, talk, when you talk about great apes, we immediately think of chimpanzees and gorillas, but our minds don't often come to the gibbons in India. And this, of course, is a fantastic animal to see. And they swing with their long arms between trees and their fruitarians and leaf eaters. And one of the best experiences to have when you go to these forests is that if you enter early in the morning, the sounds of their calls as they vocalize and announce their presence to each other it can be like a symphony, like multiple symphonies happening from different parts of the forest. And it is just beautiful. In fact, I love primates. I love anything to do with monkeys because when you go on a safari or when you're in the forest, let's say there is nothing happening. You can always be sure that when you spend time with a troop of monkeys, you are going to have some fun. There's going to be a young one playing around. They're going to be adults grooming each other. They're going to be jumping around. They're going to be climbing trees, coming down. So there's always a lot ha hap happening when you look at monkeys. In fact, if you get more technical about it, if you actually observe the troop dynamics, like females with young ones, with one male, a, a group of bachelor males, a straggler male which comes towards this group and the other males chasing it off along with the females, what happens when the dominant male of the troop dies? And then how a new male comes and kills all the young ones uh, to make sure the females breed with him. So there's a lot of things that happen if you actually spend time with a troop of monkeys. And talking about monkeys, we actually have more than, if I'm not sure of the exact number, uh, I think we have 18 species of primates in our country. It could be 16 or 18, but we have roughly 16 to 18 species of primates or monkeys in our country, including the hula gibbon which is quite fantastic uh, to look at. I mean, in South India, we have six species. And of course, when you go to the Northeast or the other parts of the Himalayas, you have other species of monkeys. One of my personal interests, of course, because I'm so, I'm so into wildlife, it has been to look at animals that are forgotten or less often seen. Uh, uh, it may not be possible for someone who wants to go see wildlife as a wildlife holiday, but because this is what I do, I'd like to go see things which are less often seen. 
uh, and one of them has, one of my hottest pursuits has been to see a pangolin in the wild and i managed it just two years ago just once in the last decade because they're such secretive animals and they're also heavily poached for again for their scales which is falsely believed to have other properties which it actually doesn't have and in fact is the most uh, trafficked or poached animal in the world right now any species of pangolin and this of course is the indian pangolin which is basically a scaly anteater it has a long tongue which it puts into ant holes and eats insects and that's what it does and when if you threaten it it curls into a ball which is surrounded by uh, armor so it's a it's a very interesting animal and Unf unfortunately we don't know i don't know much about it because i've seen it only once but it is uh, the one thing i know it is, is that we don't even know how many pangolins are there and how soon we are going to lose them it's a very very bad situation so pangolins are hard to see but what has happened in the course of our uh, recent explorations is that people like us like naturalists and scientists have figured out how to find certain animals which were earlier thought to be rare uh, one of them of course is this beautiful himalayan firefox or the red panda so all of you are familiar with the mozilla firefox web browser the red panda is the symbol for that and we have it in our himalayan forest but i don't know how many of you know it it is this beautiful red black and white animal that if you if you see it in the morning when the himalayan sun falls on it it feels like there's a fire in the forest in that small patch of forest and it's an incredibly beautiful animal we actually didn't know how many existed what happened but some guys from west bengal and nepal got together did a study worked with the locals to find a way to track them and now it's almost a, a sure shot that if you go there you will see a red panda and seeing one i can guarantee you is as special or even more than seeing a tiger in the wild so there are these lesser animals that people have understood how to find another example uh, of an animal which i thought was super rare at the start of this decade when i started work and now i feel is very easily seen is the tibetan sand fox it looks like such a weird animal like a dog with a fox like body and suddenly a fat face and this tibetan sand fox is found in parts of ladakh but is more easily seen in parts of north sikkim uh, especially in lachen langchung uh, guru drungmar lake and areas like that where there is a a lot of uh, steppe grassland and rocky areas which is again the trans himalaya of sikkim and there some uh, locals and some photographers have gone and understood this animal and actually it's become quite easy to see nowadays again an animal in the past which we didn't know this so this is kind of how wildlife experiences and wildlife tourism and uh, seeking to find wildlife grows over time you know you start with putting a buffalo in the night and sitting in a hide like james uh, like jim corbett did and then today we are going on a jeep into a forest and expect to see a tiger that's kind of how we evolved but the same thing is happening with a lot of other animals which are special but unfortunately they don't have the attention of the tiger one of uh, two of them of course lie in a particular river system which is of course the ganga brahmaputra river system but i am particularly talk about uh, the chambal river and here because of the history of chambal a lot of these animals which lived in these rivers were poorly studied poorly understood and we knew very little about them but recently a lot of people have gone into the landscapes of chambal in kota in rajasthan in up and parts of even madhya pradesh near morena and there uh, there is a lot of good things happening with these two species one on the one on top is the gangetic river dolphin which is one of the two three species of blind dolphins in the world and this is a freshwater dolphin and the one below which has a similar snout is the ganges gharial which is like a long snouted crocodile these two fish eating animals uh, they in fact they live exclusively on fish are found in this river systems only and because of overfishing and the damming of these rivers a lot of their population has been affected and of course there's a if you uh, know how much pollution we put into our rivers in uh, up and parts of uh, mp uh, there is actually a very bleak future for them but thankfully people have gone there and studied them and a lot of these sanctuaries have been created just for the gharials and the dolphins and in fact if you go there and people have actually figured out how to find them and it is an amazing experience as interesting as seeing any other animal in a country and you are in this boat in this beautiful chambal ravines and you go in and you wait for these gharials to come bask in the sun and also you wait for a dolphin to breach the surface and that is like probably a very fleeting glimpse but if you see it it is quite an amazing thing 
so we've spoken about special animals special uh, rare animals common animals interesting animals but in our country there is also a uh, special regions where even normal wildlife looks interesting and one of them i'd like to uh, talk about which is the ran of kutch so this is the ran of kutch it's a long extent of flatland and the most interesting animal over there is the uh, wild ass or the coor this animal is found only in the ran of kutch and also parts of the ran in pakistan and southern rajasthan and it's a very interesting animal um, it is it feeds on one particular grass that grows in this salty patch and it migrates throughout the ran in different parts so it requires this large extent of flat land so otherwise if you see this animal it looks like a donkey but when you see this animal in this landscape it becomes uh, an, a very very uh, interesting sight in fact when they run as a herd through the salt flats and they kick up the dust it is probably one of the most beautiful sights that one can see in the indian wilderness talking about the ran another interesting thing is because it doesn't have much trees all the animals are forced to either burrow or sit on the ground so even for to to watch eagles when you go there you see in the morning before the ground becomes hot and the thermal start the eagles can't fly so they're all sitting on the ground in different parts of this flat land so even from let's say 500 meters away you can see an eagle sitting on the ground and that's how interesting this place is so it is not a place for cats it's not a place for uh, tigers it's not a place for charismatic wildlife but is a place for a unique viewing of different things and that is what the ran is for me it's one of those incredible places which you have to go and experience especially one tip try and go during a full moon night and it is quite incredible quite amazing like beautiful interesting wildlife beautiful interesting destinations we also have experiences which are focused on interesting people and this i think is the core of any kind of wilderness tourism or any kind of guiding so this picture is of mari uh, a person i met just outside chennai in the crocodile bank and he is from the irula community i am a very avid snake watcher i love my snakes i go looking for snakes all over the place and thanks to a friend of mine who worked in crocodile bank i got to go on a walk with mari and he probably is one of the most incredible trackers i have seen i know i've seen people who track snow leopards i've seen people who track tigers i have tracked tigers and leopards but what this guy does is he took us on a let's say a 300 meter walk and he tracked snakes and i've never seen someone handle snakes so gently or be have the experience to find snakes from let's say simple things like their droppings or their tracks or where they prefer to go and he and his wife took us on this incredible 300 meter walk which lasted for like if i remember right about 5 hours so we spent 5 hours walking 300 meters with this guy but according to me it is was one of the most incredible wilderness walks i've had in my life i've been with african guides and rangers i've been in yellowstone parts of india but this walk with mari was special and that's what i'm talking about you have people who can create amazing experiences just from nothing and that is what we need to remember when you look at going for wildlife it's not about going to a national park getting into a jeep and expecting to see something it is about the people it is about the lesser things it is about the beautiful the, the beauty of the habitat it is about what makes it special and it's about the conservation story if we can put all of this together and think about all of these things when we go for a holiday or when we look in, look at going into a wilderness area our experience will be a more wholesome and a whole lot more beautiful one thing which i have not spoken about yet on this talk of course is birds uh, <laughs> we have spoken about animals throughout uh, we have very seldom spoken about birds i'm going to keep this section very brief uh, simply because i don't know how many of you are into birding or know about birds but in india we have 1350 species of birds recorded till now and there are of course more records happening year after year and of course we have a huge variety of habitats we have the deserts himalayas rainforest so we have a huge variety of birds and a lot of birds which are adapted beautifully to different habitats um, i like to start with the pretty ones of course uh, this these uh, three images are birds of our rainforest so of course the one on the top left is a beautiful species of small kingfisher called the oriental dwarf kingfisher which is found in the western ghats and also parts of northeast india the one on the right with a red belly 
is the Malabar trogon, which is found in India and Sri Lanka only. Again, a beautiful bird, if you see in the forest, perched vertically amongst the mid canopy of the forest. I mean, just stunning. And these are just a few examples which I'm giving. But to the most beautiful bird I have seen in India is, of course, the one in the bottom left. It's called the Western Tragopan. And I went particularly to one pack, pocket of forest in Great Himalayan National Park. We walked for three days to get to one forest patch. And we sat there under a tree for four hours, no sound made, to try and see if we can find one of these birds walking out. And after four hours, just before darkness, one of these males walked out with their beautiful blue, red, and uh, orange wattles and a spotted body. And it was one of those most satisfying feelings I've had. You know, you've gone all this way, sat so long, sitting quietly, not even moving your hands because you don't want the sound of your windbreaker to disturb the bird. And it was that interesting to see it. So you have actually secretive uh, species like this even today in India that you have to work hard to find. And that is where the thrill is. Uh, after you've done your initial wildlife experiences in the first two years, when you want to know what's next, what more can I challenge myself to find, or what more can I know about, these are the stories that make things interesting. But when you talk about beautiful birds, I look at beauty in two different ways. One is, of course, beautiful for the layman, where it's bright, colorful, it's all pretty. But there is also beauty in the way different species have adapted to their surroundings. And that, I think, is more beautiful than just a colorful bird. For example, this bird here is the Sri Lankan frog moth, which is found in South India. And it has adapted so perfectly to mimic a leaf that if it stays still, still in the forest, even barely three meters from you, you will not see it. And they do not move unless you go shake that branch. They can stay absolutely perfectly still. And their body patterns are so like a leaf, like a dry leaf, that it is impossible to see them. And this, I think, is as beautiful as a colorful bird, simply because they have designed over time to blend with their forest in the most perfect way. That even for a trained guide, it takes a long time to seek out a uh, a frog mouth in a tree full of dry leaves. And of course, there is another kind of birding. We look for colorful birds, you look for adaptations, but then you also look for the critically endangered. And one of the most sad stories of our country, which we are going to lose, I feel, in the coming years, is the great Indian bustard. So a, lo a lot of conversation we naturalists have is, what if the national bird in India was not the peacock, but the great Indian bustard. Maybe we could have saved the species. Because this is a, a free-ranging bird which extends over a large part of uh, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Karnataka. In fact, they were there even in Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. In fact, I think they're still there in Andhra Pradesh. But the main population is in the Thar Desert of Rajasthan, which is Desert National Park. But the number of birds right now is estimated to be less than 150. And in certain areas, there are only females and no males. So that population will never breed unless a new male is introduced or migrates there. So this is the status of this bird. And we don't know what's going to happen. So when you look for birding, when you look at birds, we also look at species that are extremely rare. But it's not just going and seeing a rare species. You need to know why it's rare, what is happening to it. In fact, there's also a story that because it's called the Great Indian Bustard and it migrates from Rajasthan to parts of Pakistan and back because the bird doesn't know what India and Pakistan is. It is heavily shot over there. But I don't believe this story. I don't want to believe it, but some people say it's true. So I, I, I don't know. So after 10 years of birding in India, I've kind of shifted my focus of birding to a very different perspective and this is also a way to bird i feel we i have been traveling extensively to see all the birds in our country i've seen over 950 bird species out of the 1350 in india but recently i've enjoyed something which i've called patch birding which is basically you find a small patch around you and you keep watching all the birds in that again and again you watch individual birds you watch them again and again you get to know them better you get to know what they're doing on a daily basis and that is that is something which is i feel nowadays is far more interesting and probably I was forced to do it because of lockdown. But it was far more interesting than going and looking at new birds every month. You know, it is now I know the magpie robin in my house really well. I know the white rump shama in my house really well. I know the three woodpecker pairs in my house. I know there's a beater in my house. I know 
there is a pair of flycatchers nesting in my windowsill and i look at these birds and i feel far more excited and there's a lot more to observe on a daily basis than just seeing it as a bird yeah it's a beautiful bird now what next no so this is what i like and this is the kind of birding i like to do and of course places like bharatpur and kutch offer you that where you can go to a particular place and just be surrounded by numbers of birds and that is a very satisfying feeling also it's not just about identification or observing it is about just being in the community of birds and enjoying and having a peaceful time but there is a few exceptional behavioral traits of certain birds one of them of course is the murmuration of starlings i'm not sure how many of you have heard, seen or heard of this but starlings when they congregate in certain numbers at dusk just before sunset they can get into these huge mega flocks of over maybe 3000 4000 birds at times and they fly in synchronism uh, in the sky and put up a beautiful show that's probably a way they communicate their day's message with each other some people say it is a way of protection it's a way of making sure they all roost together and stay safe uh, safety in numbers and all that but for me it's just a beautiful sight i took this picture in amdabad railway station and it is incredible just to see this flock of let's say 5000 rosy starlings doing their rounds for let's 15 20 minutes or sometimes even half an hour just before they go to sleep and that is a beautiful experience uh but we have one place in rajasthan when we talk about birds and numbers we have one place in rajasthan which is called kichan and this tops it all this is considered to be one of the natural wonders of the world and and i when i went and saw it in february last year just before lockdown february this year just before lockdown i felt it is something which words can't describe you have 80000 demoiselle cranes coming to a small village football ground because the villagers have been feeding them for the last 40 years and to see these birds coming in in the morning settle in front of you feed the noise the numbers the beauty of these individual birds and then they take off in waves once they're done feeding i don't think there's a more exhilarating birding experience in our country of course some people talk about amur falcons in nagaland i don't want to get into the different things but for me this tops everything and it is quite an incredible incredible sight it's a village called kichan in rajasthan in the winter months these demoiselle cranes come from central asia and some of these birds are probably coming to the same village year after year for the last 30 40 years and that's an incredible incredible thought and it is simply because some of the villagers decided that they felt compassion for these birds i am not a one who supports feeding but they are doing it and it is a incredible sight so just go see it for this beauty and don't judge i have spoken about all these interesting places these interesting sights these beautiful things but i haven't I haven't even touched about the things i love about indian forests these are of course beautiful frogs like this galaxy frog of south india it's actually found in forests around tirunelveli you have amazing snakes in our country like the from the king cobra to uh, uh, the the king cobra to the left to this beautiful iridescent snake which is found in the forest of goa it's called the pied belly shield tail it's a snake which feeds only on earthworms and eggs and it's harmless to us and we have this huge variety of snake species over 500 snake species in our country and if you actually look, go away from snakes to other reptiles you have this amazing uh, fan throated lizards also just to give you an example there are a lot of species but this lizard in the peak summer in the month of may can stand on a bare rock and display and extend its throat flap which is extremely colorful to find a female and there are stories and there is unique experiences even when you look at lesser fauna it's not, it doesn't mean that you have to look only at big mammals and things and in fact this is all i look for when i travel i i've gone over the phase where i want to see tigers and things like that i want to look at these things and i have i am not even talking much about them in this talk because i don't know how many of you like snakes don't like snakes know much about snakes but it is an incredible diversity and one that is worth spending time on and of course there is butterflies and dragonflies there is a whole lot happening in our country beyond just safaris and that is what i want to put across to you guys there is life everywhere there is interesting things happening right in your garden all you have to do is open your eyes 
and look at it. Uh, I'd like to finish off with this one image. This beautiful spider has been my desk companion for the last one and a half months. I'm not sure it's the same spider, but this spider or species of spider for some reason likes the desk where I sit with my laptop and work. And just to watch this spider grow from a small spider to different color stages, that's how spiders grow. They grow in different stages of colors. And finally to reach this beautiful adult form is a form of safari that I go through on a daily basis at home. So when you say a wilderness experience or a safari, it doesn't mean that you have to go to a grand place like Kobet or Kanha, get into a Jeep and go out and talk about great stories and parties in the weekends. It can even be something as simple as looking at the things that join you in your workspace or in your home that feel comfortable being around your house and then observing them on a daily basis. And that, trust me, tops as an experience above everything else. And this is what I'd like to finish off this talk with. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Doctor. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly fine. Thank you very much. I think, uh, yeah, as you say, one hour is certainly not enough, but it's like a teaser, and you kind of took us through a uh, huge uh, the length and breadth of the uh, country and the possibilities that we can certainly look mm -hmm. to explore after this crisis is behind us. So, uh, yeah, yeah. If you, uh, uh, do they, do anyone have, does anyone have any questions? I hope I haven't scared everyone by putting all those photos no, and no, talking about so many things. Where, uh, for you to uh, say again, the name of the place where the leopards can be seen, uh, it's. I mean, leopards can be seen everywhere. Uh, in fact, uh, there are leopards in Chengal Pit also. <laughs> but uh, the particular place that I mentioned, which is fantastic to see leopards, is a place called B E R A, Bera, B E R A, which is in Rajasthan. It is next to Udaipur. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if this is a question or if it's just uh, a query to see if you have the pictures of porcupine, is it Martin, Loris or porcupine, Aparna? Yeah, I mean, I, I do have pictures uh, of, yeah, so the slender Loris, of course, is found in South India. In fact, the best place to see it is Dindical. I've seen over 36 Loris in a short walk, but the slow Loris uh, uh, as far as my experience goes, is the good place is Assam in Gibbon Sanctuary. And that's where you see slow loris. These are basically old world monkeys. Porcupines, of course, uh, any forest rest house, any lodge which is next to a forest, where they throw their kitchen waste, if you go there, you will see porcupine. Martins is a more interesting topic. The, the yellow-throated martin in the Himalayas is a easily seen animal if you go to the right places like Pangot or parts of Bhutan or parts of Sikkim. Orbit. But the Nilgiri Martin, which is found in South India, is far more difficult to see. Uh, in all my times in the Western Ghats, I've seen it only twice. But again, a, a very rare animal and interesting animal to see. So that's what it's a, it's a huge topic. Uh, so I, I don't know how we can cover all of it. But yes, just like I gave the example of Red Panda, if people do their own research, there's a lot more to look at right in our own forests of Tamil Nadu and Kerala and Karnataka. You don't have to go very far. So I know you said, uh, you know, that uh, you, you highlighted the fact that uh, there are experiences outside these large wildlife uh, parks. Uh, and are there ways where people can uh, look and find out about people who may help them have this experience? Oh, yeah, because of course, of course. So everything, uh, everything is available uh, on the internet. Of course, uh, I'll uh, doc. You can pass my email ID to those who have attended the talk, and uh, definitely happy to help out if someone wants to do something unique. Don't uh, 
if you want to have a ranthambore holiday also i help out it's not about that but if you want to go to these off beat sites if you want to do a nice walk with the bnhs in uh, sanjay uh, gandhi national park or if you want to go with a local tribal guy in an estate in wayanad or if you want to go with a nirula chap in chennai or if you want to go with uh, the fishermen in the chambal river everything is interesting there's a lot happening you just about taking the time to know about it and i will definitely do my part to help if someone's really interested no problem you can leave my email id on the chat i'm doing that and uh, i think there are a couple of requests to see that map of india wildlife map of india again yeah i am just going to go there so this map which i have used is from his website uh, basically i the only way to get this map is you have to go to greenhumor.com and order prints he doesn't sell digital prints but you can order prints uh, but it is uh, extremely worth it and he has a whole collection of different things that you can buy there and lovely artwork absolutely fantastic uh, you can see the name in the right bottom of the screen it's called green humor is there a u or a no in the humor Humor, humor. H O is the British version. British version. So H U M O U R. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. No, I'm typing it out, so I don't want to type the wrong thing. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's greenhumor. dot com. Yeah. That's what. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, Uma, I hope there was no slide lag. Huh? No, actually, there wa there wasn't. I think you slowed down your presentation speed appropriately, so um, it was okay. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a there are a lot of appreciation. Someone wants to know if you've named your spider companion. <laughs> oh no! Uh, in fact, I have a, my neighbor's son named him the rainbow spider. Uh, But if someone wants to know the actual name, it's called the Chrysilla, C H R Y S I L L A, Chrysilla spider. But my neighbor's son came one day and he said, "Oh, that's a rainbow spider." So I've decided to call him the <laughs> rainbow spider. He's about five years old. So. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah